it turns out that there's an important connection between the stabilized object EP or K minus P and the case cohomology of the total complex, and their connection given by the filtration theorem, which occupies the central role in our discussion of spectral sequences. Now let's give an informal description of this filtration theorem. And later in the second part of this lecture, we'll give a, for a formal statement and proof of this filtration theorem. Informally, the theorem states that there's a filtration of the case cohomology of the total complex by the stabilized objects where the sum of two superscripts is equal to k. And more precisely, there's a filtration given as follows. We start with the object E0 case of infinity, which is embedded to some object F sub 1. And this E sub 1 comma k minus 1 sub infinity is isomorphic to the quotient of this guy modulated this. And similarly, f1 is a sub-object sub of f2. And e sub 2 comma k minus 1 sub infinity is a quotient of f2 modulo f1. And so on and so forth. In this case, we say the spectral sequence converges to the cohomology of the total complex. And we often say the object in the spectral sequence in a certain page abuts to the cohomology of the total complex. Here's an important special case. If we somehow know that the case cohomology of the total complex is zero, then, from this filtration theorem, we will get each f sub i equal to 0 for any i greater or equal to 1 and smaller equal to k minus 1. Every f here will be 0. Since each stabilized object in the spectral sequence involved in here is either a subobject of some f or a quotient of some f. So we have each stabilized object in a spectral sequence equal to 0 for any k greater or equal to 0 and smaller or equal to p. This special case will frequently appear in our applications. Conversely, if we know the information of each stabilized objects involved in here, we can determine f1, f2 all the way through fk sub fk minus 1. And we can determine this kth cohomology of the total complex through this filtration theorem. For instance, if we know the stabilized objects involved in this filtration are all zero, then we can also conclude that the final term, the kth cohomology of the total complex is also equal to zero. If all but one of those stabilized objects involved in this filtration are zero, then we can conclude that this last object is equal to this only non-zero object. And this follows easily from this filtration. I should call this important special cases. And this is our first special case. And this is the second special case. The third special case happens when the category we are dealing with is a category of vector spaces.
In this special case, as long as we know the dimension of those stabilized objects, we can determine the dimension of this case cohomology of the total complex. This is because when they are all finite dimensional vector spaces, the dimension of this guy will be equal to the dimension of this minus the dimension of this. So we get a system of equations based on the relations given by the, those quotients. And we add up the both sides of those equations and the dimensions of those f's will cancel out. And finally we will get the dimension of the case cohomology group of the total complex equal to the summation of those dimensions of the st stabilized objects in the spectral sequence where i ranges over the integers from 0 to k. You might think this filtration theorem is not very easy to use because it's very hard to get those stabilized objects. But in some lucky cir circumstances, the, ob the objects in the first or second pages of the spectral sequences already stabilize. And such cases will frequently appear in our application. Now let's arrive at the information from the first two pages of the spectral sequence. The first page of the spectral sequence is something we might have already seen before. The data from the first page of the spectral sequence are cohomology groups and the induced maps between them. In this picture, the black objects and black arrows are the information on the zeros page, labeled by green notations. To get the cohomology, those positions will consider the image of those arrows and the kernel of those arrows, giving us the blue arrows and objects in here. To get the cohomology, we have the induced, induced dotted arrows from image to kernel by the theory of abelian categories. The quotient, the co-kernel of those arrows will give us the cohomology groups, which are also defined to be the objects in the first page. The induced maps between those cohomology groups are actually given by those arrows in light blue. Before we construct the induced map between cohomologies, we first use the universal mapping property to get those light blue arrows between images and kernels. And the induced map between cohomologies are given by the universal mapping property using those light blue arrows. If you are not familiar with such argument in the abelian categories, please see my notes for abelian categories for the proof of exercise 1.6.d of Professor Vakio's book. And I will provide the link and notes under this video. Recall that at the beginning, we assume that all the squares are anti-commutative. But we are more familiar with the, uh, the argument with the commutative squares. What's the difference between them? Let me leave a remark to address this issue. I claim that even if those squares are anti-commutative now, the argument will be basically the same as the case when the squares are commutative. 
This is because in the diagram chasing, we often use the zero needs of the composition to get an induced map. However, the zero needs of the composition doesn't change if we change the arrow to a negative one times that arrow. For example, if we get a composition, a composition of three maps, and we replace the map in the middle by the negative one to the rth power of that map. But this new composition will still be zero because we can always move this negative sign outside of this composition. And in the abelian category, we can always do this. Therefore, the arguments using the universal mapping property still apply. And we will get all the induced arrows exactly like the commutative case. Note that the only difference between the commutative double complex and anti-commutative double complex is that there is some power of negative 1 associated to the vertical arrows. So we will only need to worry about what will happen when we attach a negative sign to one of those arrows.